episode of Virtual Coffee. My name is Alexa Collier, and on this podcast, I interview accomplished and innovative early career professionals and small business owners. With me today is Jay Couture. Jay graduated from Rutgers University in 2014 with a Bachelor of Science in Business Management. He received his Master's of Science in Management and Systems from New York University in 2019. Jay has experience as a software engineer manager at a large healthcare company and is now the Senior Director of Innovation at Anthem. Jay's expertise includes defining long-term strategy, innovating within the tech industry, and leading technological teams. Jay and I met a few years ago at my first summer internship, and he was one of my managers. So I know Jay will have a great story to tell as well as some wonderful advice. Now, before we get into Jay's story, I'd appreciate it if you could rate and review the podcast on the Apple Podcasts app. You can also find us on our social medias where we have all our other links to our other platforms. Uh, We are on Instagram and Facebook. It's at Virtual Coffee Podcast. We appreciate your support and happy listening. Let's dive into Jay's story. Welcome, Jay. Thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely, Alexa. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, let's let's dive in. So I'd love to first start with your academic career. And I'm curious what drove you to major in business management and then continue your education with pursuing your master's degree. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll give you my pragmatic perspective on this. So I think I'm, I'm kind of of two minds, but I am biased towards the pragmatic side of things. And initially I was I was considering studying either finance or something a bit more generalized within business. And initially I thought, okay, maybe I want to work on Wall Street at a financial company, an investment firm and private equity and something like that. And I started to chat with some folks who were in that industry and do some more reading and research uh, while I was still fairly early in my academic career and didn't have to make a decision about my major in undergrad anyway. And I quickly realized that at least from what I could tell, it's a fairly cutthroat industry and a little bit of a rat race. And what I mean by that is there is very little hesitation from what I've heard. And I have lots of friends who are in this industry now for folks to step on one another's toes to try to get ahead. And there are a lot of difficult politics that need to be navigated in order to continue propelling oneself forward. And I also kind of thought that uh, I wanted to do something that felt a bit more generalized so I could apply it to whatever I thought that I would be interested in. And where I'm going with this is I think that folks can make a decision about what they want to study. And I think for myself anyway, what I've kind of found, and this may not be a hard and fast rule, but essentially I think that folks can either study something that they're very passionate about and do do well, they can live well. So Mm -hmm. myself, the passion from an academic perspective would be philosophy, right? So I was very interested in studying philosophy and considering the job prospects afterwards, it'd be a little bit difficult to apply that to the business world in general. And the other side of things is to study something that is a little bit more practical in terms of application to a career. And those are kind of your STEM majors. So that's what I decided to do. Now, I decided to minor in philosophy because I still wanted to have that experience of studying something in which I was interested. So I got to take courses that were certainly relevant to my interests and continue to push the boundaries of my thinking and challenge myself. That was what the the philosophy minor gave to me. And then study something that was going to give me a a breadth of job opportunities. And that's exactly what happened. I kind of ended up in the healthcare industry and found that really I wanted to continue my academic education. I always knew that I wanted to get a master's degree and someday I'd like to get a PhD. But for now, I figured that, okay, since I studied something a little bit more generalized in my undergrad, my perspective was that, okay, I'm seeing, and I had interviewed a lot of folks at this time, I had seen a lot of folks come out of school and there are kind of two paths, right? It's either undergrad and then directly into grad school. Mm -hmm. And around the time that I was looking for jobs, that was the decision that a lot of other folks that were in my position were making. They would finish their undergrad, they would go directly for a master's degree and do it in like a five or six year program in total. And I sort of saw, now again, not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking that folks who went and got their master's right out of undergrad, it was kind of a continuation of their undergrad career. And it 
didn't having that master's degree didn't necessarily propel them forward in terms of their potential pay, at least at the time of finishing their degree. Sure, it might raise their ceiling in terms of the, the potential opportunities later down the line, but I had kind of felt that I would get more out of a master's degree if I had put in, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of three to five years in the industry and kind of mm -hmm. applying what I had learned actually on the job during that experience to my academic program and my master's. So given that I studied something a bit more generalized undergrad, which was my intention, I wanted to get a bit more specific in my master's degree. And that's why I got uh, an MS in what is essentially tech management at NYU. And those courses were certainly more challenging. It was a very rigorous program and it was not an easy thing to work full time and then take courses at night. And it took me about three years to finish my master's doing this, but I had kind of decided for myself anyway, that this was the right move to be able to minimize the amount of student loans that I had to take, given that mm -hmm. an academic education in a grad school program is an expensive thing in the US right now. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to offset those costs by continuing to work full time and come out of that program with as, as few student loans as possible so that I could start to invest and allow uh, the, the idea of compound interest to work for me. Mm -hmm. So those were the decisions that I had made. And now I, I'm not finished with my academic career. I certainly intend on going back at some point, but not in the near future. I want to go back to school to study what I'm passionate about. It will likely be something in, in philosophy where I can do some research and thinking and writing and really get into that and potentially teach in such a way that it's not related to my career in terms of the way that I support myself financially. And really what I mean by that is the idea of financial independence and early retirement and achieving a, a, a status of financial independence and then being able to make the decisions like, okay, I want to go do something with no regard for how it's going to reflect on my, you know, personal finances. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the path that I'm taking to the furthering of my, my academic career as I move forward. Yeah. I think there's a lot of good pieces of advice in that and how you explain how you made your decisions. Cause it seemed at first you, for your undergraduate major considered job prospects, your passions, possible career paths, and understood that your passion is more of a generalized degree or perhaps wouldn't get you the the job you were looking at at that time. So you leverage minors, right? You can minor in, in multiple things and learn about your passions through minors. And then as well with your master's degree and continuing your education, you can continue to study and learn about your passions, but start with perhaps a more applicable major. I, I know that's, you know, up for interpretation, but I, I love how you described how you made those decisions. I think that could be very helpful for someone who's making those decisions right now of what to consider. I'm totally with you on that. And I think it depends on what the goal is, mm -hmm. right? Not everybody has the drive to say, make a certain amount of money or raise themselves to a certain level on the corporate ladder or even work for a big corporation. Right. I know plenty of people that their sole interest and purpose in life is to study and do the thing in which they're most interested, irrespective of whether it's going to make them filthy rich. That's just mm -hmm. something that's not important to everybody. And that's not something that's important to me. But for me, finding the balance of kind of what's important while still being able to enjoy the things in which I'm interested and I'm passionate about is really what, what the goal is, at least for myself. So everybody's a little bit different, but mm -hmm. that's sort of the generalized advice that I give is major in something that is going to give you a wide range of opportunities and then minor in the thing in which you're very selective and interested and specialized as a way to get deeper in that and continue to learn and grow in that area and really find whether that's something that you want to do full time because you can always get another degree. You can always mm -hmm. get another undergrad degree. There are plenty of folks with multiple BAs or BS degrees, and there, there are folks with multiple master's degrees as well and multiple PhDs even. So there are always opportunities to go back to school and to continue to learn about and be in that, that environment for the things that either you're passionate about or the things that you think are going to 
propel you forward in your career to get to the place that you want to be. I really relate to that advice because I majored in computer science, which I knew in college I didn't necessarily want to be a software developer and go on the classic path of a computer science major, but it got me in the door of a reputable tech company and healthcare company. And now I am doing what I'm passionate about, which is consulting and design thinking and leading others. So my degree, I really haven't leveraged code, right? I haven't coded in years, but that got me my opportunity. So I completely relate. I think that's excellent advice. I'm just I, sort of remembering our, the discussions that we had about mm -hmm. that when we were working together. Yep. And um, I recall at that, at that point too, you were saying the same things. Like I, I'm studying computer science. I don't necessarily want to do mm -hmm. coding. And I was trying to look for opportunities for you to build on some of the skills that would help you diversify a little bit away from doing programming and, and coding per se into some of the more softer skills or, or less technical skills that would help you get into a role that is a bit more leadership management consulting focused. And it sounds like uh, you've, you've figured those pieces out and are <laughs> pretty, pretty happy about where you've gotten to. Definitely. Yeah. So far it's all good. And yeah, your advice you gave me a few years ago, two or three years ago really did help me because I was able to explore the more business side of tech and that's what I fell in love with. And that's the path I'm on now. So I have, yes, I definitely do have you to thank for that as well. You did all the work. <laughs> no, but I, you need that guidance and that mentorship. And I, I definitely appreciate that. So I'd love if you could walk us through your career journey, just a quick overview of where you're at now, where you came from, uh, just a, an overview of your career path. Yeah, absolutely. So I had done a few internships to sort of see what I liked, see what I didn't like, and ended up interning at United Health Group IT, which is now Optum Technology and kind of learned about this technology development program and received an offer at the end of the internship. And of course, this was in my junior year. And I decided that I really didn't want to stress during my senior year and look for different jobs. I didn't want to work in New York City. I was, I was living in New Jersey and the job was in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. It was an easy commute from where I was living, and I figured that this was a, a good opportunity for me to accept the offer. And really, I think that from the guidance I had gotten, rotation programs can be a very good thing. And the, the technology development program was a two-year rotation program with three eight-month rotations. So I had the ability to try a few different things. And I personally valued that, especially given that I was a little bit more generalized in my in my academic studies and wanted to see what I liked, right? I wanted to try some of the more financial modeling side of things. And I wanted to try a bit more of the development side of things and really see, uh, see what I liked so that I could start to focus a bit more on that. So I, I started that rotation program much more on the financial side of things, given that was kind of where my interest was at the time. And I was doing revenue modeling and implementation of Salesforce uh, for a particular team and starting to think through cloud technology and the, the finances associated with that and budgeting. So that was kind of an interesting first rotation. I had a great, a great mentor at the time who gave me a lot of very good guidance and moved into uh, an opportunity that sort of came up in my second rotation where I could learn a bit more of the technical side of things and do a bit more of backend development in big data in particular. And at the time, this was a fairly nascent, a nascent space with uh, Hadoop coming onto the scene and MapReduce and, you know, writing scoop scripts and creating hive tables as kind of the new technology that was hot on the scene and using uh, SAS visual analytics to do some of the uh, plotting of, of the statistics. So I had an opportunity to work through some of that and learn some of those harder technical skills to see if that was something that I liked and kind of realize that, okay, I have the competency to do this, but I don't necessarily love it. And I also got a little bit deeper into more of the clinical side of things in healthcare uh, during that rotation. So I took a little bit of a step back and sort of um, as you've kind of progressed in your career, 
took on a little bit more of a consulting role, although this one was a, a tad more reporting focused. So building out dashboards and working in what was at the time the professional services organization and doing more kind of presentations, reporting, building business cases to take to the capital committee, that sort of thing. And then towards the end of that rotation, that group split off and I had a, an opportunity at that time to work with the transformation team that was kind of focused in digital transformation for the software development arm of, of Optum. And that was a fantastic opportunity. I got to work with some great people on a small agile team and think through some of the metrics around how digital transformation was occurring and get very familiar with agile in software development and get very familiar with um, doing cost cutting exercises in terms of process simplification and really getting a handle on sort of the innovative, the inventory of innovative activities that were occurring across the organization. So I got to learn from and speak with a litany of leaders across the organization to kind of hear about what they were doing. So this was a, a great opportunity for me. And as I had been in that role for about a year or so, the leader of that team had left the company and I had a new leader who was building the Boston office, which is the office in which I met you. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> she said to me, well, listen, we don't have any leadership here. We have hundreds of interns coming in and we don't have anybody to manage them. I know that you are young in your career, but I want you to start traveling up here and do a trial run to see how that's going to go. So that's obviously how, how you and I met. You were mm -hmm. part of one of my intern teams. And I don't know that I was ready at that time, but I don't know if anybody's ever really ready to <laughs> start down the mentorship, sponsorship, and management side of things. So I got to apply the experience that I had gotten prior to helping come up with some cool ideas and giving some guidance to the amazing, talented teams of interns that we had. And uh, I mean, I, I think about you and the rest of the team very regularly and wonder where folks are at. And I get to check in on LinkedIn and see see what happens uh, with everybody's interests and careers. And I've had so many folks reach back out to me. So, I mean, we got to build some really cool things together. And I sort of just got to watch watch the interactions with with folks and kind of their areas of interest and learning about the the corporate environment and navigating such a strange structure. And then from there, I, after the internships had ended, I had the opportunity to build my own team, which I did. So I had a bunch of full stack engineers and it was sort of just a natural evolution of, of where I was and building a, a much bigger PNL to manage and, and thinking about the budgeting and the utilization. And I think at, at one point we had probably 20 folks on the team with seven interns in the Jersey office. So that was a super exciting opportunity with lots of visibility. And I got to learn a lot through that experience. I think that that's probably too big a team for anybody to directly manage, in, in my opinion. And I had felt that I was getting a little bit further away from having direct impact on the work that I was doing, because mm -hmm. a lot of the guidance I was receiving from my mentors was, okay, you need to lead people, need to have a team, need to manage an organization, need to manage your own p &L. And I got there very quickly in my career. And then after, you know, maybe a year and a half of doing this, I kind of realized, well, I'm not really building things anymore. So the right opportunity came to me to switch to Anthem, which is the company that I'm at now in the innovation space and start to build something from scratch. And that's sort of exactly what I've done with what we call uh, Anthem's digital data sandbox. That's uh, the, the platform and the program that I lead for Anthem right now as part of Anthem Digital. And I just have a small team uh, under me that, that works on the platform with me. And essentially what we do is provide data, certified de-identified data for startups, researchers, and other organizations to work with. So it's a, a massive, massive set of data. And I would plug the website that we have up. It's anthem.ai slash sandbox. If folks want to learn a little bit more about what we're doing in that space, but that has been an awesome opportunity to really build something from the ground up and have a fairly large budget to sort of take the vision that I had and was kind of co-created with my leadership and put something into practice and operationalize it and see it through to fruition. And the platform has been live in production for 
over a year now and we've done, you know, like over 20, 20 different use cases and we've worked with universities, we've run hackathons uh, across the world and just a lot of really, really exciting things and opportunities. And I've gotten to travel kind of all over the country, travel to different countries, speak at conferences, meet hundreds and hundreds of people. And it's uh, it's been an incredible ride so far and I'm, I'm excited to see what comes next. Thank you for diving into that. Such an incredible career journey so far and you're only, what, five-ish years in? <laughs> that's That's awesome. I love how you went through a rotational program, see what you like doing there, testing out different positions. Then you ended up, you know, leading a team, realized, oh, perhaps this this size of a team's too large, but I do like leading, want to lead a smaller team. Like it seems you're just constantly experimenting with your career to figure out what exactly you like. And of course, that's probably gonna change over and over again over the course of your career, but it's all about that experimenting and carving your own path. That's, I really relate to that. It's just seeing what you like and going after that. And, oh, whoa, that's not what I expected. Okay, how can I pivot? What can I go to next? You've done so many things in just five years. I think that's incredible. Well, thank you. I guess it's it's probably more like six now, mm-hmm. something like that. But it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride. And I guess my, I'm of the opinion that you can kind of either go, I think, the terminology they say I-shaped or T-shaped, right? Mm, mm-hmm. And go a bit broader in terms of experience or go very, very deep in something. Now, I've had sort of the opportunity to do both. And I think that the way to make the decision that is right for oneself is to try a bunch of different things. And mm-hmm. given that my experience is more in technology and software development, what that means for me is kind of as I see a grid, there is the startup and then mid-sized company, and then you know large Fortune 500 company mm-hmm. in terms of the vertical. And then in terms of the horizontal, there is the early stage kind of like idea and concept development and funding all of those pieces. And then there's the early stage of bringing those ideas into kind of you know proof of concept, proof of technology, testing, and then taking it to you know PI one. And kind of that MVP or minimum viable product, like uh, Eric Rice talks about in the Lean Startup. Mm-hmm. And then after that is really the progression to the operational model, uh, the fantastic consulting word that we use, operationalization. That doesn't really actually mean much, but we use that <laughs> word all the time. And after that, it's kind of maintenance mode. And then the very last piece is sort of the decommissioning, sunsetting. So if I look across all of those, you know, maybe four or five categories on the the left axis and three or four on the top, I've done sort of something in all of those spaces at uh, a large company. That's kind Mm -hmm. of been what I've tried to do. And I haven't done that at a startup, but if I think about it, the way that my current team operates and sort of had been built from the ground up as a edge part of the organization, that's almost operating like a startup within a corporate environment. So it can kind of fall under that. But essentially, you know, playing bingo across this this checkerboard here of the different opportunities to really build my skill set and be able to say, yep, this is a problem that I've seen. It's a challenge that, you know, I can think about how to solve because I've got some experience doing something like it and continually throwing myself at new challenging problems with really the goal being to be able to have a solid leadership position, because if you think about the C-level execs at any large company or even at a startup, they need to know how to do all of those things. And how do you think folks at that level get there? Well, they've they've sort of worked on all these different pieces and have solved all of these problems. So when they come up at an organizational level, they're able to provide direction and guidance to steer the company to a a place of really scalability and, and profitability. I really like that visual you painted of that grid and mapping your experience. And yeah, you need that experience in order to lead, right? You need to experience the execution and doing doing the groundwork in order to eventually lead the people doing that work. I really like that visual. I want to map out my own experience and continue plotting on that grid. I think that's a great visual. So with your years of experience, you know, as a leader in a large healthcare company, Uh, I'm curious what advice you have for those earlier on their careers, perhaps just starting out 
first day on the job um, who are currently navigating a large corporation because that can be very intimidating and you might feel stuck because the company's so large. Do you have advice for for folks who find themselves in that position? Absolutely, that's a, a great question. Something that I certainly considered when I was at that point in time is some, certainly something that I reconsider when I start on a new team or you know in a new role or in a new organization. And some of the best advice that I had gotten from one of my early mentors was to read a book called The First 90 Days. It's a Harvard Business Review book. It's a little bit dry, but it kind of talks through ways to set oneself up for success in a new role within the first 90 days. And I can shoot you a link to uh, the author. I don't have it off the top of my head, but sort of what I got out of that and applying my own experience, I think that mentorship and sponsorship are two separate things and they're very, very important and they are born out of building connections with other people. And I won't hesitate to say that I'm an introvert. I dislike the idea of networking and meeting tons of people. But with all of that said, it's super, super important to one's career progression to have multiple mentors in different capacities who are able to provide guidance when you've run up against a problem that you don't necessarily know how to solve or you need some advice or somebody can provide some perspective that you can't necessarily see yourself. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by the difference between mentorship and sponsorship is really mentorship is providing guidance and advice, while sponsorship is the ability to provide opportunities. And I took a really interesting class in my undergrad called Women in Business. And one of the things that I learned in that class is women in the business world in particular are often over mentored and under sponsored. Hmm. So as I kind of consider that, and especially in the the current situation where we bring in socioeconomic disparities and all of the ethnic differences that are occurring in the different ways that people are treated in terms of cognitive bias, whether it's conscious or subconscious, I think that the most important thing personally that organizations can do is to provide equal levels of mentorship and sponsorship and make those available for everyone that that wants to seek them. And historically, that's not something that is structured. That's what I liked about the technology development program and the rotation program is you were given a navigation coach who was kind of your assigned mentor and you had assignments to go speak with leaders across the company. And I kind of learned that by force and by habit. So I'm super, super grateful for that. But I think a lot of a lot of folks entering their career early don't necessarily get that advice. And what that means practically is find time, like take a look at your company's organization or their org structure and map out some of the folks who are a bit higher up. So, you know, three, four, five levels above, not necessarily the CEO, that person that's going to be difficult to get time on their calendar Mm -hmm. unless you have a very, very good reason. But folks at the director, senior director, VP, senior VP level, send an intro email, say, hi, I'm new to the company. I'm working on this within this team. I'm interested in this. I'd love to know if you could free up 30 minutes or so just to talk to me about your career progression and what your team does and what your goals are for this year. And throw that on the calendar two, three, four weeks in advance because that's when calendars free up for folks that are super, super busy. And then have those conversations very candidly and try to do one or two of those a week. So set them up and just constantly have an hour a week where you're doing this networking with more senior leadership. And that's something that is very impressive Uh, when you are a senior leader and there's somebody new to the organization and you see that that's somebody that you need to keep an eye out for that could become part of your succession plan and that may be able to help you. And sort of what goes along with that and receiving that level of mentorship and sponsorship is when you join an organization, there is a ramp up time. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the research suggests that it takes uh, somewhere like eight to 12 months to, to reach that break even point of your cost to providing value to the organization. So I think we all know when you start a new role, you're going to have downtime. A great way to spend that downtime as you ramp up and kind of learn about your role, your projects, your programs, whatever that looks like, is to do some of this networking with senior leaders and say, hey, I, you know, I have a little bit of extra time and I'm super interested in what you're doing. Is there some way that I can be of assistance to you? And by doing that, you were sort of building some goodwill with that leader 
and able to show them the quality of your work and your work ethic while doing multiple things at the same time. So if you ever decide, okay, this current role is not really for me, you've now got a network of six, 12, 20 people that know the quality of your work. They know how you are as an employee. They know that you're driven and you have a relationship with them. You can reach out and say, hey, I really liked that thing that you had me work on. Can I do some more of that? Can we make this into a formal role? And as you do that, you'll find folks that are really good mentors that have a ton of experience. They have good advice. They have good opportunities and they're willing to put those opportunities in front of you. So I think the very common thing you hear is that people don't quit jobs. They quit bosses. Mm -hmm. And just because you don't have a great relationship with your boss or you don't see eye to eye doesn't mean you need to leave the organization. It just means that you need to find the right opportunity and the right boss. And often that's somebody else within the organization. So within my career, I've had probably like 10 or 12 different bosses, uh, not because I intentionally chose them, but partly due to rotations and mm -hmm. leaders leaving and just, you know, new opportunities. I mean, being able to work for a lot of different people, you kind of find what types of bosses you, you click with and work well with and which ones you don't. So I think that that's probably the most important advice that I can give. Thank you for sharing that. I must have gotten this advice from you a few years ago because the advice I, so. I yeah, because what I always give to new people entering the company when they ask for my advice, I say leverage your newness, like leverage the fact that you're an intern or in a rotational program or just new to the company and book time on people's calendars. Worst comes the worst, they decline it okay, no problem. They were busy. That's fine. Yeah. I give the same advice and I did the same thing and it greatly helps you because now you're building your network in your company. You have this full list of people you can contact for advice, guidance. Um, and I also really like that you brought up mentorship, mentorship versus sponsorship. I don't know why I can't say that right now. Um, but I feel like that's a newer, thing people are talking about in the business world. I'm sure it was always there, but there's all this advice to find mentors, find mentors, find mentors. But what about your sponsors? And mm -hmm. that's something I want to do now is take a look at who I'm considering my mentors. Maybe some of them are actually sponsoring me instead, right? Maybe they're not the ones I go to every week for advice or every month for advice, but they're ones I work with either underneath them, with them, who have my back, who are opening opportunities for me. I'm glad you brought that up because I think more people need to take a deeper look at that as who are your mentors versus who are your sponsors. Absolutely. And I think I, I probably recall giving you a list of like 10 or 12 names of people mm -hmm. to talk to. And I was like, set up time with these people. <laughs> exactly. No. And I, I did just that. And that's, I still try to do that. And I still give that advice. I, I loved that advice. It really, really helped me and continues to help me to this day. I would make the argument that sponsorship is actually more important than mentorship. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of one of the reasons that I chose my, my last boss was because I noticed that she was really giving me a lot of opportunities to push myself and to do different things and meet a lot of people and present to senior leadership and just do all of these things that I had never done before while receiving little to no mentorship. Mm -hmm. So the way that I approached that was I seized all of those opportunities that she put in front of me. And there were lots and lots of challenges that I wasn't receiving the mentorship on. And I had to go to somebody else to receive the mentorship. And then the combination of those two things is what has wow. propelled me um, as, as quickly as it has in my, in my current organization. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'm just going through my head right now, folks who I just call them my mentors, but I think they're actually my sponsors because they open up the opportunities for me and I take them like you're saying, and then I go to other people for that actual advice. Yeah, that's that's great. I want to take a look at, at those in my network. Awesome. So switching topics a little bit here, I'm really curious how you balance the drive to innovate and be an innovator always looking, you know, one step ahead, creating change, how you balance that with executing day-to-day -day responsibilities. So this is something I've been thinking about recently is you need to execute your day-to-day -day work. I'm still in that stage of my career where I'm very much an executor, but I want to start to dip my toe into the creating change, one step ahead, innovating, you know, head in the sky, big picture type of leader. 
but how do you, you can't just stop executing work. So I'm curious your advice on that and how you balance those two, two things there. Yeah, that's a, a great question and sort of a, a challenge for the ages and almost a Sisyphean task. So the way that I think about it and what I always say is that the hardest part of innovation is change management. Mm -hmm. It's not coming up with new ideas. It's not proving out the technology. It's getting folks on board with the new ideas. And in terms of execution, that's just something that has to be done. So it almost entails doing double duty. And what I've found being kind of in the sole innovation team for Anthem is that the amount of time and effort in doing change management. And what I mean by that is giving presentations, mm -hmm. managing up, managing down, managing laterally, creating the vision. I mean, I have spent hundreds of hours churning the same four or five sets of slides for presentations <laughs> across the organization and externally and internally and getting them approved by the dozen reviewers that need to approve them. And that is such a painful process. And I also really, I don't like the reporting process at all. It's such a manual, difficult thing to do because it requires the synthesis of information and the summarization to a level that is digestible. Now you can take notes on every single action that you take and give it to your boss and they're not going to read it. You can send it every mm -hmm. week. They're not going to read it. And there are multiple levels of reporting that need to be done and it needs to be done in the right way for your audience. I always say, reach, shape your message to your audience. Now, when I provide my monthly reports to our chief digital officer, I hit the high points. I go metrics first and I do it in an email with like five to seven bullet points of five to seven words or less. And then I attach a slide deck with the entire 40 slides worth of everything going on within my portfolio in the month in case he wants to go into the deeper level of detail. And I ensure that that same message is communicated at different levels. So my, my direct boss needs a bit more detail than that when we talk about all of my activities. And then when I talk to other folks in the organization who are interested in leveraging my platform, they need a different slice of that message but the tricky part, especially, you know, when I take the same kind of message and vision to the capital committee for funding and budgeting, there needs to be extreme consistency across the visioneering and the communication so that when somebody in contacts A, B, or C hears about what I am doing, they are able to immediately connect the dots in their brain between what all of those things are and understand implicitly what I'm trying to do, why I'm trying to do it, and why it's valuable to them and why it's valuable to the company. And that's how we get promoters, right? So when you spend all that time helping folks to understand why what we're doing is important to them and how it helps drive their strategic priorities forward and why they should care, then those folks engage and they're willing to put time, resources, and effort into your hands to help you get done what you need to get done. And this is a vastly more true for some of the more stringent folks. And these mm -hmm. are your compliance, privacy, legal, regulatory, PR, corporate communications, all of the reviewer and regulatory related folks who have a very set standard for how things are supposed to go. When you're trying to do something that is outside the bounds of what they're used to, you need to get them to be promoters, entice them to be promoters of what you're doing so that when their boss or the chief privacy officer says, why would we ever approve this? They're able to come to your defense and say, actually, this is a really good idea. And here's why. So doing that change management, that's almost like a CEO job in and of itself, right? The visioneering, the communications, that's a full-time job. The execution is also a full-time job. So Unfortunately or fortunately, really the only folks that are able to survive in the environment in which I work are folks that are able to do double duty and do okay. really two full-time jobs at the same time. Now, is that ideal in terms of work-life balance? No, absolutely not. But if you want to learn and you have the time, the effort, the energy to put towards doing that, you can absolutely take your, your career, your knowledge base, your expertise to new heights 
10 times faster than anybody you've ever met if you're able to deliver at that level. So it's very high risk, very high reward, and really only for the, the folks who have the passion to solve the problems. If I didn't have the passion for kind of, you know, my own healthcare journey and how it drives the work that I'm doing and the change that I'm having, I don't think I would have the, the energy to push forward and drive as hard as I do to get things done and to change minds and to bring folks onto, you know, the side of really understanding why we're doing what we're doing. And here's kind of my closing point on this. If somebody else thinks that they came up with the idea that you've been pounding into their head for the last six months, <laughs> you've done your job properly mm -hmm. as an innovator. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I had a feeling the answer was you need to execute and do change management. Like it's not one or the other. You kind of have to do both. That's the conclusion I've been coming to as well. But yeah, all about what you're saying about shaping your message to your audience, always presenting the why and starting with the why completely agree. I mean, that's, I, I do that every day. That's a huge part of my job is, is expressing the why and telling the why and just understanding your audience. So, so important in order to convert your audience to promoters of your ideas, of your innovations, just excellent advice and very well stated. Yeah. I think I just need to buckle in and, and keep on executing and also try to move into that change management, innovative space a bit more. I'll quickly add to that. One of the interesting things that I didn't have a lot of experience in was it was telling the story. And that entails weaving a story arc through the messaging of kind of explaining why you're doing what you're doing and kind mm -hmm. of what the functionality is. And I read a great book called Story 10X. I don't have the author offhand. I've got the book, I don't know, somewhere in the house here. I can, I can <laughs> shoot you the author's name. Sure. But that really kind of talks through how to weave together a narrative that makes sense, that pulls people through it, keeps them interested, and that you can reuse as you continue to have those conversations with other groups of folks. So mm -hmm. that is the reason for all the time spent doing revisions and churns on slides and making, you know, different versions of very similar slides is yeah. really perfecting that narrative so that it is part of the DNA of it becomes part of the DNA of the person that is hearing your pitch for what you're doing. Exactly. Are you are you familiar with the Decker framework from yes. Kelly Decker? Yeah. Nope. I love. I was gonna say it's exactly what you're describing is understanding how to tell your story and to what audience. And that framework starts with understanding your audience, which is such a critical step in in telling any story and explaining any why. Now, I'm curious what your goals are for your future and your career. Do you do you have a final destination in mind or are you more following the opportunities and the experiments as as they arise? It's a challenging question to answer because I think if you were to ask me six months from now, my answer mm -hmm. might change. And if you had asked me six months ago, my answer would probably be different. But I think as I spend more time in my career, and I'm more exposed to the higher levels of how organizations operate, I find that it, for me anyway, it becomes more and more important to be fully vested in what I'm doing. And I think the reason that I've done so many different things is because what I like to do is I like to build things from the ground up. And once I get them working properly, I like to go build that next thing. Mm. I'm not, I mean, I've done it, but I'm not really the the person that takes something that is a well-oiled machine and just keeps it maintaining and running. Uh, even with cars, I, I want to have a new car every two or three years. Like <laughs> I just, the, the newness factor and kind of learning and overcoming challenges is something that I really enjoy. So that's what keeps me engaged. And I find that if I do the same thing for too long, I become disengaged because mm -hmm. it almost goes on autopilot because I'm, I'm solving the same challenges that I've already solved. And when I find myself in that space, I know it's time for me to take on a new challenge. And that doesn't necessarily mean a new company or right. a new team or anything. It just, it just means I need to start working on something new. And there are many ways to craft that. But in terms of the end goal, I 
don't necessarily see myself as a C-level exec at a Fortune 500 company. I think that the level of stress and sacrifice that is needed to operate in one of those roles for any extended period of time is A, of course, commendable, and B, not necessarily something that I want for myself. I do value work-life balance, and I have a lot of hobbies. There are a lot of things that I like to do, and I'm not somebody that the only thing in my life is work and sleep. There are more things that I care about. I play guitar, I play piano, I play video games, I read, I have a fairly active social life, I enjoy lifting and exercise. I've got all kinds of different things that are fulfilling to me. And if I cut out the time to do those things, and I, I call them active decompression, um, then I start to just get too tightly wound and I'm no longer enjoying what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that as long as I'm able to continue enjoying what I'm doing, and make the transition to some of those hobbies that are currently just hobbies and passions and make them more of a vocation, a labor of love in a space where I don't need to rely on the financial income of a steady job. And I can do some of those things full time. Like I can think about writing a book or I can think about producing an album or learning music theory or mm -hmm. studying philosophy or any of these other things that are not going to pay the bills and reach that level of fulfillment that I am getting now in my current role that I think a lot of folks are able to achieve when they say, let's say somebody's really passionate about photography and they study photography and they make a career out of it. And they're probably not making, you know, 10 million bucks a year doing it, but they're really happy with their life. And it's very fulfilling. I think that that is, is certainly achievable while or after having kind of your standard corporate career. I'm remembering how similar we are, Jay, because I, I also feel for me, I know it'll be time for a new opportunity when I'm no longer learning or growing, specifically learning in my role. And yeah. that's when I know, okay, it's, yeah, it doesn't have to be a new team or a new company, but it's time for something new. And I also very much value work-life balance. I believe it's a thing and you need to find the balance and I cannot work 24 seven. I, I love work, but I need the life aspect too. It's just funny. I'm just relating so much to everything you're saying. And this advice applies to me so well. Yeah. I'm just remembering how, how similar we view careers and, and kind of life in general. So speaking of that work life balance, I'd love to know from your experience, you know, in this moment, what are your top two to three best practices for balancing work, life, your passions, your hobbies? Um, what are those those best practices that you found so far? I struggle to answer that question because a lot of times the hardest advice to take is your own advice. Mm. I think I know conceptually what I should be doing to maintain better work-life balance, although a lot of times I fail to execute on that. So intellectually, I know that having a regular sleep schedule where I'm regimented and I go to bed and wake up at the same time and being able to take a break from my work day for like five or 10 minutes, especially given, you know, the current environment of a lot of folks working from home, like it would, the right thing to do would be every two hours, stop staring at emails and meetings <laughs> and go take a walk outside. Yep. I'm not able to do, I, I'm sure I'm able <laughs> to do it. I'm just not doing it. It never uh, happens. It just never happens. <laughs> right. I mean, I have I have days where I, I won't eat, you know, breakfast until three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. um, because I've just got too many meetings. So I, I think the advice that I am starting to follow that I'm able to give is learn and celebrate saying learn how to say no and celebrate saying no. Mm. And what that means is if somebody puts a meeting on your calendar, that doesn't mean that you have to attend it. If somebody sends you an email, it doesn't mean that you have to respond to it. And it doesn't mean that you have to respond to it immediately. And you don't have to respond to emails after any certain time. Now, self-discipline comes into play here. If and, and one of my team's rules is if there is a meeting and it doesn't have a set agenda and a descriptive title, 
you don't have to attend that meeting. Mm -hmm. That means that if somebody hasn't put the time and effort into their meeting invite and blocked off the time on my calendar and let me know and given me the context for why my time is being spent with them to help them with whatever they're trying to do, then it's not the most efficient and effective use of my time. So I do decline, say, standing meetings that are an hour that are giving updates for something that's not directly related to what I'm doing. But if they say, hey, this week there is an occurrence where I need you to do something, I will join for those occurrences. And a lot of times, too, delegation is the answer. And myself, I'm a, a little bit of a control freak, so it's difficult for me to delegate things and trust other people to do things to the same level of quality that I would do them. And building trust is an extremely important part of managing a team. So that's just sort of a, a leap of faith. And I will have things come up where I will just kind of punt them and ask the folks on my team, say, hey, can you take this for me and let me know how it goes? Of course, ping me if you need me, but mm -hmm. um, I trust you to handle this. And I think the other thing I would add is having those active decompression hobbies, like watching Netflix is not an active decompression hobby. <laughs> Going outside and riding a bike or playing music or reading or anything that kind of mentally or physically or both engages you is something that will help take your mind off of the work thing. Like even just going for a walk doesn't necessarily take your mind off of whatever's going on with work. But if you have to play music or you're listening to music or yeah. you're writing or creating something – you need to engage a different part of your brain and clear your brain of all of the work stuff that's going on. So that's something in which I'm a very, very big believer is just having those, those things that constitute active decompression in your life as hobbies and making the time to do them regularly. Like as a, as a musician, if I don't play guitar for two weeks, my skills get very rusty. I can no longer play it the way that I once did. I need to play just for 10, 15 minutes every day or two to maintain my skills. And there are a lot of things that are like that, especially when it comes to fitness and exercise or, you know, cooking and nutrition. If you don't do something a lot or often rather, it doesn't need to be for long periods of time. Well, we sort of fall out of the rhythm. So I think building habits around those, those passions and hobbies are very important as well and building them into your schedule. Yeah, these are great reminders, even for myself. So the learning to say no and celebrating saying no, I love that. Because especially when you're first starting out on your career, I feel like it's our instinct to accept everything. Like, oh, they right. sent this to me. It must, it has to be important. And that's not always true. So what, and at some point, especially in large corporations, you get to a point where nine to five, you're in meetings. When mm -hmm. are you going to do your own work? There's no right. time until, unless you work till 9 p.m., which then you're taking away your work-life balance. So yeah, ev trying to evaluate where you need to be and where you need to put your time and prioritizing those meetings and giving yourself time to get things done is so important. And then also that time to actively decompress, especially now when no one really has a commute anymore if we're working from home. That used to be... I know it, it might not be considered active decompressed time, but my, you know, hour drive home from work, I could turn on a podcast, I could listen to music, I can just kind of slowly take my mind off of work. So I arrive at home, ready to enjoy the evening. Whereas now I log off, and I'm already home. And so it's really hard for me to stop thinking about work unless I okay, let's work out. Let's go for a walk. I just need that time to slowly stop thinking about work because it's it's really hard to shut off immediately in an instant. That's right. And two things there. On, on the first point, I'm going to challenge you to say no to 10 things this week. That okay. sounds like a lot, but keep a metric of how many things you say no to. And saying no doesn't have to mean, no, it's not worth my time. It can mean not right now, or I'm mm -hmm. going to address it later, or let me know if you really need me there. But saying no in some form or fashion to 10 things, and I don't know that you'll get to all 10. You can certainly try, but use that as a way to, to gauge what's really important and what's really valuable to spend your time on, because that's the most valuable thing that you have. And when it comes to working from home, um, that's something that I've got now a little bit of experience doing. 
I found that having a dedicated space for working yes. is really, really important. And it's almost like when you leave the office, when you leave that dedicated space, and this isn't viable for everyone, but shutting work off, right? So I have an office, I have a room that is my office, and I don't do a great job of this because sometimes I'm in there answering emails till 3 a.m. But <laughs> when I when I walk out of my office, work is, and it's not to like grab something to eat, but I'm done with my work for the day and I shut the door to my office, I, I leave it. I don't go mm -hmm. in there to do other things. I don't go in there to read. That is a really good way of kind of creating a boundary. And you're the only person that can hold yourself to the boundaries that you set. So keeping yourself accountable for the boundaries that you set up and even in your kind of personal relationships um, is something that's very important. Yeah, and I, I will give a yes in there because I know in my situation, our office room is where my husband works and he's also working from home. So it's it's just hard to have us both in, in one room taking calls. So my desk has been our dining room table, which we don't use to eat anyway. So even if you don't have that office space where you can close your room, uh, close the door, I know it is a bit more challenging, but at least that table is for work only. We are not eating there. I know I can still see it throughout the weekend. That's okay. It's a little challenging, but that's work. And if I'm sitting at that desk, I'm working. If I, as soon as I kind of push the chair back underneath the table, we're done working and, and the laptop shut off. So even if you don't have that door to close, create those boundaries, even if they're not physical boundaries, create them in your mind of that's workspace. The rest is home space. Yeah, completely agree. That's right. And I think the worst thing that you can do is, and I think a lot of folks kind of come into this as they start transitioning to working from home, they're like, oh, wow, I can wake up half an hour before my first meeting and just bring up my laptop in bed and look at emails and yep. stuff. That, in my experience, makes it really challenging to separate like sleeping and your room that you have for yes. non-work related activities from your work life. And if you have a stressful job like I do, the last thing that you want to do is is to wake up in a panic attack on Saturday morning and it's nine o'clock and you're like, oh my God, I think I just missed three meetings and thinking about <laughs> all the work things that are going on. And then you realize it's Saturday and yeah. that is not a good way to start your weekend. Exactly. Completely agree. I know we could talk about work-life balance tips forever. <laughs> um, but my last big question here for you is in this moment right now, what is your proudest accomplishment? Now, this can be related to your career or not at all. It can be a personal accomplishment separate from your career. It can be from 10 years ago or from an hour ago. Right now, what is your proudest accomplishment? So I'm going to go with something not work-related. Sure. And I used to compete in powerlifting mm -hmm. uh, in the USA Powerlifting Federation which is drug tested powerlifting. And it's a sport where essentially the goal is to lift the maximum amount of weight one time in three different lifts, the squat, the bench, and the deadlift. Okay. And I trained and competed in this sport at the national level for multiple years. It was something that was uh, important to me in terms of a hobby. I had a large social group around this. It was a big part of who I was. And I had to have hip surgeries on both of my hips due to a congenital defect. It wasn't due to anything that I had done. It's just something that I had inherited to reconstruct uh, the bones and fix the labrums in both of my hips. And the labrum is the, I think it's a ligament that acts as a, a washer between your, your ball and socket. Now these are very intensive surgeries. It's akin to a hip replacement. I had these surgeries done about six weeks apart and it's a, it's a very long recovery time. It's about, you know, eight months to a year until you're able to really do things the way that you're able to do them before the surgeries. So after my surgeries, I spent the time and the effort building back up essentially from ground zero into, you know, the sport of powerlifting again. And I was able to surpass my previous best numbers in all three of my lifts from prior to my surgeries. And now I don't compete and train for powerlifting anymore. My work schedule has made that, or ra rather my travel schedule mm. has made that challenging and it's no longer an important thing to me. 
But having having done that and kind of shown myself that I have the ability to overcome any obstacle, whether or not it is self-imposed or self-inflicted, is something that really demonstrates the tenacity that I have to be able to set my mind to something and to do it no matter what it is. Well, congratulations on that. That's an incredible accomplishment. That, yeah, the amount of perseverance that takes, I'm I'm sure is more than I have. So congratulations on that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I, I, Jay, I really enjoyed catching up and hearing your story and what you've been up to these last few years and hearing your advice as well. And I will take that challenge of trying to say no to at least 10 things and keep you updated. Uh, but before we sign off here, where can people find you? Are, are you on LinkedIn? Do you want to shout out any other social medias? Yeah, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. And um, if folks are interested kind of professionally in what I'm doing, they can check out the, the website that we have for my platform. But yeah, professionally, LinkedIn is, is probably the best way to get connected with me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Alexa. It's great catching up and glad to hear that you're doing so well and that things are going well in your personal life and your career and especially with the podcast. It's been a blast hearing all of the insights that you've been gathering from from young professionals and also kind of your experiences interper interspersed. Appreciate the support, Jay. Thank you.